So it's a great honor to introduce Dominic Barton as part of our Global Speaker Series today. Uh, Dominic is the Global Managing Director of McKinsey, where he has worked for over 25 years serving clients across a range of industries and geographies. Prior to his position as Global Managing Director, Dominic was head of the McKinsey Asia region and head of the career office. In addition to his client work, Dominic has authored numerous articles and, and publications um, on topics of global relevance to business leaders and policymakers. In addition to that, Dominic is also a trustee of the Brookings Institute, of the Rhodes Trust, and an honorary fellow at Bracenose College at Oxford University. Please join me in welcoming Dominic to the stage. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much, and, and thanks so much for, uh, for coming out this afternoon. As, as was mentioned, what I'm hoping to do, if it's okay, is just talk for 20 or 25 minutes until, until you throw things at me, and then I would be most interested in any questions on, and on anything at all uh, as it relates to McKinsey or anything else, any advice, criticism, whatever you like. So please, uh, I'm looking forward to the, the questions as we go through it. What, what I wanted to do over the next uh, 20 to 25 minutes was just give a overview of some of the big trends that we're seeing in the world. Um, and basically, uh, it, it's my belief, and I think many uh, people who are running organizations around the world would have this view that we are living in truly historic times. And by historic times, I don't mean in the last 20 or 30 years, I mean over a 200 to 300 year time frame. And sometimes I wonder if maybe that's what everyone thinks when they're leading. They happen to be leading in that time that's unusual. I, I, have, I really do believe this, and none of you are going to be around in 300 years, I think, so you won't know whether what I'm saying is right or not. But what I would say is that the amount of change that we're seeing now is just, I think, unprecedented on, on many different levels. And this page here, this simple page, I, I'm going to spend a bit of time going through what we think some of the forces are and why I think they're historic in sort of scale and, and speed with which they're happening. Uh, many of which you're in the center of here in the world. I think you're, but, but also you're not in the center of many of the other ones. And I think you need to be connected to where those changes uh, are, are occurring. And so after talking a bit about that, I want to talk about what the implications are for being a leader in these times. Because I think the definition of what leadership is and what's being required over the last 20 years will not be as relevant as what's going to be required over the next 20 to 30 years as we go ahead. So that's just a bit of the overview. I want to start with one of the biggest forces that's out there. And again, I think in many ways we all know it, but I just wanted to mention it a bit. And we call it the great rebalancing. And then to our friends from Xinhua, where you know China is very much a part of that. This is the emerging markets. It's China, Indonesia, Indonesia, and Africa where we're going to see a billion new middle class consumers within the next 10 years. And one of the ways I, I try and illustrate it is just through photos. I'll show you some facts. But this is a photo I actually took in Shanghai in 1997. And it's a photo of uh, Pudong, or as many of my New York colleagues in McKinsey call it, Pooh Jersey, as you sort of look across the, the water. And if you look at what that looks like in, in 1997, it was a uh, a field. I mean, there was, a, there was actually onions that were being grown. I don't know if any of the uh, colleagues here from Xinhua were from uh, Shanghai, but that's what it looked like in 1997. In 2004, that's what it looked like. Sort of again, seven years later, that's the kind of the, the transformation. And that's happening in 200 cities in China right now. And it's relentless. It's urbanization. And you know what? That urbanization is happening no matter what happens to the Eurozone, whether those countries get coordinated or not, or what happens in Washington with the fiscal cliff, it doesn't matter. There's always going to be 1.2 million people a week in the world going from rural areas to cities. It's like gravity. It's a, it's a gravitational force. And that's something that I think is going to generate a huge amount of opportunity, business opportunities but also a huge amount of challenge for us in terms of resources. But that's, so this is the big shift, is this rural to urban shift, 1.2 million people a week. We're going to have a billion new middle class consumers, as I said, in about seven years. We'll have 3 billion new middle class consumers by 2030. That is unprecedented in human history. We've never seen anything uh, of, that, of that scale. And just to put it in, in again, 
rank order, if you will. If we think about the Industrial Revolution, the Industrial Revolution uh, had about uh, uh, a tenth of the people and took about 100 times as long to be able to have a transformation. So the Industrial Revolution, which is seen as a, if you think about it in our human history, as a major discontinuity, is a speed bump compared to what we're seeing here. So again, it's just to give you a sense of the scale of, of what's actually happening. And this is where those three billion uh, new middle class consumers are gonna come from. We know about China, uh, we know about uh, India, we should not forget about Africa. And just to give you a factoid, in Nigeria this year, there will be more babies born than all of Europe combined. Right, so we have images, right, of Nigeria, some corrupt, terrible infrastructure, backward place. It is actually one of the youngest populations in the world, a dynamic place. A lot of amazing businesses are being born right now as we, we go through it. If you talk to the CEO of Procter & Gamble or uh, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, Beecham and so forth, they will say their future CEO is now working somewhere in Africa, right? It's getting, it used to be that was the case in Asia. Africa is the place, and I could go Brazil as well is also a, a big shift, but there, this again is something that's there. All I would say on that is, I'll get to this in a minute, as leaders, no matter what you do, whether you're gonna invent a, a, a new technology or a new business, or whether you're gonna work with an existing business, that's the world you're gonna be leading in, and so when you think about your networks and the business people that you connect with, it's gonna be vitally important that you know people in China and Brazil and Nigeria. It's very important. One of the things I'm trying to encourage very much in McKinsey is within your first two years in McKinsey, I want every single consultant to have met a Chinese executive, a Russian executive, a Brazilian executive, an Indian executive, and a Nigerian executive. Now I could, you could pick different people, but I want them to meet these executives. Every executive is different. I'm not going to say they represent it, but there are differences in terms of how people think in terms of time frame, how they think about their community. And so it's vitally important to build these global relationships because that's the world uh, that you're, you're gonna be uh, living in. We think it's gonna be cities more than countries that matter. You know, we, we're talking about China, I think it's too big of a country to talk about as a country. It's really cities. And the way we look at it is there are about 440 cities that are gonna account for 60% of the world's GDP growth. Many of these cities, uh, to be very honest with you, I've never even heard of, right? But their names you don't know. And this is our, we have a city database that we've built of these 440 cities, and we use it with clients. So for example, if you are, if you are, in, the, if you are in the diaper business, uh, for example, or in laundry care, the top 20 cities uh, over the next 10 years are the following. That's where you wanna make sure uh, you're, you're gonna be based, right, as you go through it. If you think about, again, the young 18 to 22 year old consumer group, those are the key cities that you're gonna be looking at. Again, places like Kampala and Uganda pop up. That isn't sort of a traditional city that would show up on someone's strategic map. But I think it's very important to understand where these cities are. By the way, in McKinsey, we, we aren't very good at taking our own medicine, so we've actually applied this to ourselves as well, and it's been quite revealing to us about where we're not and where we should be uh, in, in different, parts, uh, different parts of the world. Um, I'm gonna just skip uh, ahead here just in terms of the second four. So that's the rebalancing is this billion to three billion new middle class consumers. We've never seen anything of that scale ever in our history, right? So that's the first force. The second one is an aging population. This is just looking at, uh, at um, uh, Asia in particular, but we're gonna have gone from having 10 workers for a retiree in the year 2000 to basically having three working adults per, for a retiree. And if you are a government in that, looking at those numbers, you are gonna be terrified about wh what that means. Because it's, it's, how are you gonna support an aged population like that. And this is a big issue for China. It's obviously already an issue for Japan and Korea. But we do have an aging population, even though there are places like Nigeria and India that are young. And so how do we deal with a much older population is gonna be a very big shift, not in terms of just the products and services, but also how we do work. I personally think that 
uh, one of the new areas of opportunity is in lifetime education. The idea that you know, we go to university, you do uh, uh, you know, undergraduate and then graduate and you're done is just a, I think we'll be laughing about that in 15 years and going, I can't believe how those guys did that. It's good. I think we're gonna see universities for people who are at 50 and then who are at 75 because they're, as they think about the next wave of what they're gonna do in terms of where they move. And so this notion of lifetime education and retooling is gonna be important because an older part of the population is gonna to have to work and we're gonna to have to rethink how we do a lot of our social uh, services and so forth as we, as we go through it. Um, I, I feel a bit nervous talking about technology with this group. I, I actually come here to learn, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. But a third force that's out there, which I think is one of the most profound, is technology change. Well, I, I have a rule in my role in McKinsey. I've been doing this role for about four years, and I didn't join McKinsey to do internal work. I didn't want to, I didn't join McKinsey to, to manage McKinsey, if you will. I like doing external work. So I have a rule which is, I see two CEOs a day, no matter what, every day, which I've been doing. And what I will do in, the, in, in many of those meetings is ask people, what are the, what are the three top issues on your mind? What, what keeps you up at night? What excites you? Always one of the top two is technology. And it's usually I'm paranoid and excited. I'm paranoid and excited because it, it is moving at five times faster than management. It's how do I keep up? And so if you're Mike Duke at Walmart, who's built a very successful business based on a footprint, a physical footprint that's out there, and you see the dramatic shift in how consumers are buying online and you know all that, you have to think about reinventing your business. And that's hard when you're a very, very large organization. But we see that in every single sector. There is not a single sector on the planet that is immune to the technology shift. And I would actually argue that some of the most profound changes are gonna occur in healthcare, which is a, forgive my language on this, is a completely technology retarded industry. I've never seen anything as pathetic, except perhaps for education, which I think is also in that league, just way back. Agriculture and food, I'm gonna to come to this in a second, is gonna be a very, very vital industry for all of us. The opportunity for technology improvement, applying technology to agriculture, I think is gonna be a massive opportunity uh, as, as we go ahead. So technology is, is, is key, everyone's struggling to deal with it. We were talking before the session, we have a lot of clients that we are now are keen to actually spend time here, just understanding. It's like, my view, Silicon Valley is like a different country. It's not coming to the US, it's coming to a different country and understanding some of the dynamics and where things are going. And you're gonna see mining companies, we're gonna see oil and gas companies, ag food companies coming here to figure that out. One of the, the, the shifts I did it really wanted to focus a bit on is the big data opportunity that we've created more data as humans in the last two years than we have in our entire existence before two years before. And that's the amount we're generating. The problem is 95% of that data is useless. 5% of it is phenomenally useful. And so what are the skills you have to have to be able to mine that data, to be able to make things work? And there are some pretty phenomenal things that are going on on that front. By the way, I think that the leading edge in data is, is not in the Silicon Valley. I actually think the leading thinking in data right now is in Shenzhen, in China. It's not here. And the reason for that is because the largest e-commerce market in the world is China right now. And if you, if you look at what Taobao and others are doing with the, the, the data and what they're moving, there's a lot that's happening. But I think it's gonna be vital for all businesses to learn how to leverage big data. What are the skills that are required? How can we apply it and so forth? So the technology shift, I'm not even talking about how telecommunications and mobile, what that's doing to various businesses like healthcare, where you were seeing dramatically different healthcare services, especially in emerging markets because of the application of technology. You know, we, I'll give one example. There's a company in India that has 100 doctors in a call center uh, has 5,000 nurse practitioners that they basically have eight months education uh, in you know, diagnosing the basic of diseases that are serving two million people at a quality of health that is better than what you get in New York. Right? Now, 
that's a different model. I don't think that would be approved in the United States to have a bunch of call center doctors and eight month nurse practitioners. But in many of these countries we get, we're seeing changes that way in, in some of the shifts. So there's a lot of innovation on that side. Uh, am I going at an okay, pay, uh, to, guys, seriously, if I go, tell me to go faster, you just tell me. I'm, um, I'm gonna skip ahead a bit on the, on the data side. I just say that again, the opportunity for every single uh, sector out there is huge, and, I, and again, even I said McKinsey, we need to take our own medicine on that. We're not. We're actually shifting some of our hiring, if you will. We've hired about 500 data analysts uh, in the last year just to be able to try and keep up with it. The, um, the fourth force I wanted to talk about, so I've talked about the rebalancing. Uh, I've talked about the big data uh, issue, the aging uh, population in the world. The fourth one is really around resources. And what this uh, chart basically just tries to show is that over the last 100 years, commodity prices, so this is oil and gas, basic minerals and so forth, have been in a 70-year decline. They've been, they've been dropping as we've been applying technology, have been much better at, at finding the places where we can look for these resources. Over the last 10 years, they've gone up about 150%. Right? Now, there are, there are bubbles in that. Sometimes it spikes higher, uh, sometimes it's lower. But the long-term trend is up, rising commodity prices. And that's, that's, it's very simple. It's because of the billion new middle-class consumers and then the three billion wanting to buy cell phones and refrigerators and cars and so forth. That takes the resources. And that's going to be a very big issue that we're all going to have to be able to uh, deal with over time. One small story I'll say is when Xi Jinping was the party secretary in Shanghai, I was in our Shanghai office, I had no idea that he was going to be uh, moving up. I, we have no clue. We're politically naive in McKinsey. We had a request from, from the mayor's office uh, to see him. And, and believe it or not, no one, everyone was too busy. No one wanted to go. So I went with a business analyst. And the question we were asked was, can you give us your top 100 articles on sustainability. It was like 100 articles on sustainability. I said, I can't even think of 20. I mean, 100. He said, I want 100. And so we wrote uh, a list. I couldn't get to 100. We ended up at like 63 or 67 and sent it uh, to him. And about two weeks later, we got a note back saying, if anyone ever asks you for this again, this is what I'd recommend you send. Don't send the 63 or uh, 67. Send 17, and this is my rank order. So obviously he read them all, which I hadn't, no one, none of us had. So you got a sense of here's this guy <laughs> reading this stuff. Um, and then about uh, a month and a half later, he went up to, to Beijing. And I think, it's, that's, I think it's quite interesting that the leader of China is that interested and focused on sustainability. And I don't think that's a gimmick. I, you know, I, don't, I think you are either interested in it or you're not. You're not going to read that stuff. And I think the reason you have to be interested because if you want the, the, that those people that are moving from the rural areas to the urban areas to have the same quality of life as to what we all uh, uh, aspire to and not melt the planet or have what's happened in Beijing in the last couple of weeks happen where it's, you know, the pollution levels are 75 times higher than what a basic safety level is, we have to deal with that. So there's a sustainability issue and there's actually then just an absolute amount of food requirement basically you know I'm, I'm from Canada originally and what we've noticed is there's a lot of interest from countries around the world in buying land in Canada agricultural land uh, right for for security reasons how am I going to get secured supply for soybeans how am I going to get uh, secured supply for grains you see this in the Ukraine you see Ethiopia is going to be one of the largest bread baskets in the world it's got the most uh, I'd argue viable arable lands, 80 million hectares, water and so forth. And you see again, many countries around the world looking at how to secure resources as we go through it. So again, the challenges are significant uh, on, on that front. The one I just want to point to is water. We, we did some analysis to look at the water demand and supply, looking at every single water basin on the planet. We did this with the IFC, uh, with Standard Chartered Bank, with Syngenta, with Coca-Cola. And it was basically just a model to look at wh where the water is, what we think reasonably would be the demand and supply. And the worrying thing is if you go to 2030 and we use water the way we're using it today, we will have a 40% excess demand 
versus supply of water. And, and the problem with water, right, is it doesn't follow political boundaries. Water doesn't really care who's the government. It just kind of flows where it wants to. And if you're in places in Asia, uh, and if you're, for example, Vietnam, and the Mekong source comes from China, and China wants to do some damming of the river, or if you're in Iraq, and Turkey decides they want to dam some of the rivers there, this, this gets into political tensions. And that's why I think the Himalayas are a very strategic spot in the world. That's the source of six of the, or seven, of the largest river systems in the world. I don't think it's so much about Tibet and other things. Those are issues there. I think it's actually about water. And I think this is going to be a very vital resource uh, for, for all of us. Um, the final one is just on government. I, I think that the fifth force, I'd say, is that governments, especially Western governments, are under huge pressure uh, to be able to deal with all this dislocation and issues. I would argue that the model of Western democracy needs a transformation. I think we all realize that. I was just in Davos in the last four days, and it was interesting that in whatever the topic that was discussed, the issue always came back to governance and saying, how can we possibly change how government works to be able to deal with these long-term issues and how, and, and how we deal with things? And I think especially for Western democracy, and not, we need democracy in democratic systems, but the model by which it works doesn't seem to be fit for some of the challenges that we have. And the problem is the dislocation issues are going to get worse. But one of the things I worry most about is income inequality, which is rising basically in every single country on Earth, except, uh, interestingly, Colombia and Brazil. And when you have rising income inequality, you get instability and you get a crisis. And so I think us as capitalists, and McKinsey, we, we're sort of the running dog capitalists, if you want to call it that. If we don't think more broadly about inequality and jobs and 75 million youth unemployed, if we don't think about that, the, the system is going to get changed. And it won't get changed in the way we'd like it to work. And so the idea of business playing a broader role in society is an extremely important part of what we do. And I'd argue that all business leaders have to take care of the society in which they operate. I, I want to go off piste on this, but if you actually look at what Adam Smith wrote in his first book, which was the theory of moral sentiments, he said it's the duty of the entrepreneur to take care of the society in which they operate. You, you could argue that's a fairly left-wing thing to say. It's very different than what our capitalist system is really pushing right now, which is a more narrow short-term model. And so that, there's going to have to be some changes, too, in terms of how uh, that, uh, that works. Um, this is, again, just to show the, some of the changes over time. In McKinsey, what we did was forecast a demand and supply for jobs uh, looking out to 2020. And what you see is a, there's going to be a big uh, excess demand versus supply for skilled jobs, and there's going to be an excess supply of unskilled workers. And that's, that gap causes tremendous uh, tension. And uh, if you're in China, that, that can cause more severe issues. And that's why in the, if you look at the 12 five-year plan, as you guys well know, what it, the very first objective is create 43 million jobs. It's not GDP growth. It's, not, it's create 43 million jobs a year, because if we don't, you get, uh, you get challenges. The infrastructure requirements are going to be huge. Um, volatility, with, when you have these five forces going up, the volatility in the world is going to be higher. The thing that's also we, we should realize, the number of natural disasters that we've had and, and natural uh, challenges that the world's faced has actually increased at a significantly higher rate. There has been a change. So the world has got more volatile because you, I think you have these five forces coming together. And then we have the natural world has become more volatile. So dealing with a with, as, as you probably heard that boring phrase, VUCA, the you know, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. That's, that's the new normal for everyone as they, uh, as they look ahead. And this is the last page I'm going to say, no, no, I'll shut up up here. It, it's, I, I hope I've given you a bit of a sense of the world. This is a, a time of tremendous change. You have these big five forces, that each one of which I think is significant enough to make this a time of historic change. You put all five together, and the volatility you've got, you've got a lot of shifts that are going to go on, going on. It's my view, and I say this, is I'm actually jealous of you, 
I'm very jealous of you because you guys are going to lead in this incredible time. You, I, think there's, I think I'm an optimist. I think there'll be massive opportunities. Just again, in, in the consumer goods area, given that billion new middle class consumers, there will, there's a need for 76 Procter and Gambles to be created over the next seven years, just to, just to even satisfy it. So the, that's a small smidgen of what I'm, the business opportunities are massive uh, and, and, and all over the world and in every sector. But the final page, uh, and the thing I wanted to talk about is leadership requirements are gonna be different to be able to deal in that world. We've had a model which I think has been focused on the CEO sort of riding on a white horse, the kind of Jack Welch, uh, be all, know all, kind of set the direction for five years. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not disparaging of Jack Welch, he's a great leader. But I think that model of, the, of what we've had in, our, in the books and the, and the many things that have been written about the single person with a clear view five years out of where they're going uh, is completely irrelevant to what's going to happen as we go ahead. And the way we're, we're looking at this, and uh, it, we, we've uh, been spending a lot of time talking with leaders who are leading now in terms of, of what they're doing, especially since the financial crisis and so forth, is we actually think you have to look at leadership in two parts. There's what leaders do, the role, and then there, I think, is more importantly who the leader is, your character. And I think we focus too much in places like McKinsey and in business schools on what leaders do, what, how you spend your time, what you should focus on, what decisions you should make. And we don't spend enough time on the who you are, the character. And we would argue that the character is a muscle. It, it actually is something that can be built. You're not born with it. You learn these skills as you go through it. And I just want to focus on a couple of them. On the, maybe the what you do and what might be different, I, I, maybe I just, I'll, I'll pick on two. One is the telescope and microscope. And I've heard this from many leaders today that say basically in this world that's very volatile, yet there's these big secular trends going on. And I, I learned this actually from the Minister of Finance in Canada, Jim Flaherty, during the, the, the uh, financial crisis. And he said, I need to be used to having a telescope in one eye and a microscope in the other without getting a headache. And it, I don't know if anyone's tried that. You put a microscope in one eye. It's not a very pleasant uh, experience. You can't focus. But the point is you need to because you have to have a short-term microscopic view because there are so many uh, volatile things happening. You could be out of business. You could, you, because of risks, because of a new competitor, whatever you want to say, that you have to manage for the very short term. The reputational issues, there's so many issues going on. But at the same time, you have to think long-term about where you want to be. And so if I translate that just to McKinsey, what we're finding in the work we do, we are doing a lot more literally 30-day scenario plans for companies. Like what, what, are we, what are we gonna be able to do to make sure we're agile as a company? Because you, if you're a big institution like a Walmart or a Procter & Gamble or a, a GlaxoSmithKline Beecham, you have, to, you have to be able to run like hell as an elephant. You, you can't sort of trundle around. You have to, how do you move very quickly because you, literally can be out of business in a six month period if you're not careful. And I, mean, I could register the st stories that you, you know well. Look at Best Buy, which I think is, uh, is, is doing well now, but look at the challenge. And they were the darling of the industry only two years ago. You look at, you look at, the, you, you look at what's happening with Nokia, Apple, uh, Samsung, and so forth, and the paranoia that's in there about how quickly. So the short term is important. But you, we're also doing not those 30-day views, we're also doing 2020 views, which is, that may be the case, but where do we wanna be in 2020? What should our footprint look like? What should our talent look like? If you believe that billion uh, new middle-class consumers and three billion, what, how many of those people should be on my board? You know, do, uh, how many Chinese, Nigerians, Brazilians do I have on my board as a multinational company? How, what percent of my top 100 comes from that area? What proportion of my investments are being done in that area? So, the, so you need the short term and the long term as, as, at the same time. The other one I'd say is tri-sector athlete. I, I think again, if I could do my career over in McKinsey, I wished I'd had more experience working in the public sector and the social sector. If you wanna be a 
private sector, hardcore capitalist business, shareholder value driven person, that's all you want to do. You will not be successful in my view unless you've had experience with the public sector and the social sector. And if you want to be a very successful public sector leader, I think you have to have experience in the private sector and the social sector, and the same goes for the social sector. If you want to be a great social sector leader, you need that. And that's this tri-sector athlete notion which Joe Nye has, uh, has come up with uh, before. And that's something that we've actually, uh, three McKinsey people have left the firm to set up a tri-sector athlete uh, forum uh, that they're running out of Washington. And the notion here is just to get experiences working in these different places because you have to understand the mindset of the challenges that are going on. I, I, again, I could go on and on and on on that, but I think thinking about those experiences. So in McKinsey, for example, our public sector practice and social sector practice are absolutely critical, in my view, for our leadership development, right? For people to have that experience. And we're very encouraging of people leaving to go do that for a couple of years and then come back. If you know, we'd like them to come back, sometimes they may stay and go do, but we need much more uh, circulation, if you will, that's, uh, that's going on. So those are just two comments I'd make on, the, on, the, on, on it is what is it that people do and the capabilities they have. And the other part I would just say is on the personal attributes. This is the character and the strong sense of purpose, um, the calm in the, in the eye of the hurricane. Just maybe two stories on that. On sense of purpose, what, one thing we've discovered is a lot of CEOs saying, we notice there's more right versus right decisions, right? It, you know, these are the decisions where it, it's, if you, both decisions are good outcomes. The problem is one is negatively affects the other. So how do you, it's easy to make a decision when you go, I can make more money by doing this uh, versus that. What happens if there are situations which they're, they're about your culture or your values? It's, and so I'll give you an example. Howard Schultz, you know, and he was thinking about uh, what he was doing at, uh, at Starbucks and he had the view, we need to have the next generation of leadership. It's very important we go down a generation, get young people to be able to drive the place and move it forward. I feel very strongly about how that moves. And what happens when his current young CEO is not performing very well? and he reinserts himself. That's a right versus right because he's breaking a cultural norm he wanted to set, but for the business he thinks it's critical. And I'm not, it's probably not a very good example, but I'm just trying to, there, there, are, exa or there, there are more moral examples. I'll give you another example, Fonterra, which is the dairy, is one of the largest uh, dairy producers in the world. What if your researchers come to you and say, our, our cows can produce more milk if we abort fetuses on a regular basis? Okay, and you could say, well, they're animals. I mean, so what? We just sort of move that. We, we just, that's a good way. It's a way to get more milk production. That's a good thing to do. It act, there is actually a little bit of a, that's not a decision that you just jump into. And if you talk to the CEO of Ontario, he'll say, I get one of those a week, right? They're slightly, uh, they're not just decisions where you move. They're right versus right decisions, more moral decisions that one has to think about and what you're doing. And so it's very important to think in your organization about what you stand for and how you base yourself and where you're moving or you could find yourself moving uh, off course. The last one I just say, calm in the eye of the hurricane. Because of all these volatility, this is the last story I'll end up with is what I, when I meet many CEOs and there's one fellow running a very large uh, global insurance company. I remember meeting him and he said, I said, what, I always ask them, what do you wish you'd learned uh, at the beginning of your career that you know now, after sort of 10 years being a CEO, what is it that you wish you learned? What this guy said is, I, I wished I'd learned about compartmentalization. I said, well, what does that mean? And he said, well, if I'd met you in my first uh, few days as being CEO, I would have kicked you out of my office within five minutes. And I said, is it, why did I offend? You know, is it something about me? And he goes, no, because in my first few days on the job, I, my general counsel had come in literally when I was meeting, uh, it was actually someone from Goldman Sachs, and they said, we've been sued for six and a half billion dollars and we're probably gonna lose it, the lawsuit. And he said that, I couldn't concentrate anymore after that, like I, all I said was, my God, how are we gonna deal with this? And so I became obsessed. He goes, when I'm talking to you right now, I have six of those types of things that are like plates spinning behind my head. They're big issues, but I'm focused on you. I'm not, I'm not distracted by those six things and that takes, uh, that takes some agility in your brain to be able to stay focused 
and then handle some weird things that are going on. That's kind of the, the way it is. And I asked, I asked him, how do you learn that? I said, is that, how could you learn to be uh, compartmentalized and, and resilient? And he said, I, I don't know. And he said, but I'll tell you something where I have learned about it is at West Point. And I said, really, the military? And he goes, yeah. He goes, what they do with the plebe class, or at least it was one that session that he went to, is they would say, we're going to give you an engineering problem, which is how to build a bridge that's being destroyed. You've got 30 minutes. It's more a mathematics uh, problem. But at the same time you do that, you're going to be crawling under barbed wire with what the cadets think is live machine gun fire. So you don't want to kind of raise your head. So while you're solving the math problem, you've got to crawl under the barbed wire. And I was thinking I'd probably put that into a McKinsey training program. So we get people <laughs> going. But these notions of, again, of character, it's sort of what's your, your purpose. Um, and again, I, I would urge, we were talking about this before, read Clayton Christ Christensen's stuff, not about innovation, but about how one measures one's life. It's a v very worthwhile, his HBR article or the actual book that he's just written, just on, if you want to learn more about that, just on purpose. But there's a lot around character, resilience. And uh, the last thing I'll say, and I promise I'll shut up, is one thing we've learned in, in McKinsey, when we look at people in McKinsey who have more successful careers, and that's, by the way, outside McKinsey, not just inside McKinsey, uh, versus their cohorts, what we found is the more successful group has had more bad luck than the less successful group. And that seems a bit counterintuitive, right? How could that be the case? The more successful people have had more bad luck than less successful. And the reason is, as you know, they've taken more swings at the bat. They've taken more risk and they've failed. They've actually failed more, but they get up off their ass and they keep moving. They don't stop. They, they, keep, they keep moving. And one of the things I think that's very important in the character side is how can we give people many chances to try things, recognizing that they're going to fail and then allow them to, to, keep, to keep moving forward. And we found that in other uh, industries and, and professions as well. So a time of historic change, uh, a time for new type of leadership in, in what you're doing. And as I said, again, I'm jealous of, for you guys because you're going to be leading in, in, this, in these historic times. Oh, shut up right there. And why don't we go to, uh, to questions? Yeah. <clears throat> One here, I think. Dominic, thanks for coming today. Um, my name is Federico. I'm a second year MBA here, and I'm from Italy. So, in all these big changes that are happening and uh, will continue in the future, where do you see a lot of the growth coming? Will it be just big companies getting bigger, or also entrepreneurship? And uh, and how does that impact um, the model of a consulting firm helping those clients? So what are the big challenges and opportunities for a firm like McKinsey in the future? Sure. Well, for, I, I think there's going to be a huge number of new companies growing. If you, you look at the, the, the in, in the 1930s, the average lifetime of an S&P 500 company was about 90 years, right? That's how long they would last. Today, it's about 17 years, right? So the, if I, it sounds negative, I don't mean the death rate of companies is actually quite high. And I, by the way, I, I worry about that in McKinsey too, right? We're not immune. We have to, you have to keep changing. If, you don't, if your clock speed is not at where the market is, which is going faster and faster, you will be gone. There's just there's no uh, way. And, and I think in that vein, we're going to see, just because of that, more new companies that are being created. But if I looked at those sectors that are they're going on, if I, again, I look at ag food, I think is going to be one of the single largest uh, business opportunities in the world. There's, it is a very fragmented, unsophisticated value chain. It's like mining was 30 years ago. I think we're going to see a huge amount of innovation. Um, companies that we don't even know about that are going to be very significant companies um, over time. That's going to be a very big area. I think in the, as I said, on the, the whole um, information services related businesses that, are, that we're going to see formed are going to be mammoth. It's a new service sector, if you will. Um, if you just think about, you know, even, you know, um, the, the businesses that provide information on used car sales, right? It seems like a pretty boring, benign business. I think that's going to become one of the most significant 
businesses that, that's out there because of, of just how people use technology. That's one in China, for example, which is a, a, huge, op, a huge opportunity. I think that also the form of business will change. I, I just I think retail will be will be online. It already basically has become that way in China, much more so than us. In fact, we've got entrepreneurs that we're working with in China that are now focused on buying land where they think warehouses will be built to supply the online. That's sort of their business model. They're trying to because of just the scale of, of where that's going. Um, I think education is going to be a massive business because of this lifetime. A learning, I think the transformation about how education is done, especially at the junior levels. We were talking about uh, Herman Greff from Sparebank. If you get a chance to hear him, his view is that the bulk of our educational money should be focused on preschool because he thinks that he, he believes in a lot of the science that is that you know your brain is basically formed by the time you're six. So that's where we should be putting 80% of our money. And he's actually building businesses on this side of it. I don't know whether the science is exactly right or not, but I'm just saying that that's a change. Healthcare, which I said again is a backward business from a consumer side. I, I, could, I could list off 50 different businesses. You know, if I get fired from McKinsey, I, I just, I, there's so many opportunities on that, just on the healthcare side of what could be done. So I, I, think, it's, I think it's a time of huge entrepreneurial opportunity. And for McKinsey, I think the issue is we need to make sure that we're working not with the existing large players. And by the way, they're important because they are, they're changing. They're not dying. They're, they're trying to move. But it's very important we work with small players. So when I was in Davos, for example, I made it a point this time. I basically met with organizations that had a market cap of less than $200 million. Right? And if I look at some of them in Africa, for example, I met uh, a bank CEO, this, this was a little larger, they bought a billion dollar market cap. They remind me of Indian banks in the mid 1990s. Um, so we, what we're having to do is work with smaller institutions that are more faster paced. Uh, we also have to be able to work with um, large organizations to help them basically build their attackers, right, in terms of how they're operating. And the way we work with clients, I don't, our clients don't just want project teams of people to come in and serve them. Sometimes they just want data, right? So we're, we're doing a lot of work in healthcare right now where the hospital group wants our benchmark data, which is propriety, the proprietary that we've built, and then have some people that can help advise them on how to use that information. So we're now, we've probably acquired, I guess, four uh, data, proprietary data companies in the last year as we build that out. And I, I don't think we're moving fast enough uh, on, on that side. So I. I think there's, again, I think it's a time of huge opportunity and change in terms of, of the businesses to be built. Uh, yeah. Go here and then, yeah. Thanks for the interesting talk. How do you see the governance structure changing in organizations? Do you still see hierarchy in 2050 or any thoughts on that? And then also the income gap. So today the CEO is 300x of average worker in the U.S. in terms of income. You see that shifting or it will remain the same? Yeah. I, I think we're definitely going to see um, flatter organizations or multi-leader organizations. One of the last books that Marvin Bauer, who's really the founder of McKinsey, wrote uh, was called The Leadership Organization. His view is that a partnership model, because in, in McKinsey, I'm not really the leader. I'd like to say I was. No one, none of the partners would really believe that. We're all, everyone is a partner, is out there doing what they want to do. In fact, the reason I joined McKinsey is I didn't want to be told what to do. And if someone did tell me what to do, it's kind of like the hair on the back of your neck goes up because I want to have the freedom to build whatever practice I want to do. And I think, in, as I mentioned, in these organizations where there was this model of the one CEO that has all the views, with that complexity, one person can't, there's no way you can handle that. So I think we're going to see much broader leadership groups where you have more ownership together uh, in, in the organization. And we're seeing that uh, happening um, in, in organizations where you have more leaders uh, that they may have an area of specialization, but they have a common ownership. Of, of where they need to do. So I think we're going to see flatter, broader leadership structures in terms of, of companies and where they are. And related to that too, I do think the income gap is going to shift. I think that if there are some 
vital parts of organizations that may be six levels down in the organization. And again, I don't want to speak for, for Apple, but if you're the person who is building the curves on the tablets and so forth, that's a pretty critical, or doing the technology on that side, that, that may be creating a huge amount of the value that's actually occurring uh, in the organization. I think people are going to recognize specialty and capability more so that you're going to see more variation. In ma many views, it's kind of like, well, I think investment banking is going through a major transformation. It, it's it, it, the banking industry as whole, as whole is going through it. One of the things that was always interesting in investment banking, and you could argue that the compensation has been out of whack and so forth, the, the top person in the investment bank very rarely was the most highly paid person, right? I mean, you, had, you just had wide variation. So I think you'll see a broader uh, view about that. My own personal view, and this is more a political view, is I, I actually think we're going to see, um, I, I think the excesses are going to have to come be, be, be taken back, either by, I think it's very difficult to say you can't have more than 300 times. I don't believe in forcing it, but I, I'm actually then a believer in tax. I, I, I actually think we should pay more tax. It may seem like a non, but I, I think you, someone has to pay for that dislocation of the job. Government can't do it. And, and so someone's going to have to pay for it. And so I think either way, the, the net, if you will, is going gonna, is gonna to come closer together for it to be a more vibrant system. That's, just, that's a personal view. Yeah. How do you see the... Um, the kind of the overcoming the scarcity mentality around the resource issues that you pointed out with water and other things. How do you see that evolving? I mean, hopefully it doesn't come to warfare, but how can we get ahead of that, you know, as nations or communities to where, you know, spoke of land, both land, arable land being brought up and water resources. How do you see that playing out? Is there a good scenario that this could turn out to be a happy ending rather than some of the, the negative paths that could go down? Yeah, I'm, I'm, hope, I'm hopeful and hoping that we're going to actually add another dimension to our metrics, which is natural capital. We, we don't actually measure that, if you, if you will. I mean, it's an externality. So this is, a, and, and what I mean by that is our, you know, the carbon that we're putting into the air or how efficiently we're using water, or how much water we have. There's a, I think there's a notion of natural capital that isn't there. And what, what I think is very interesting, in Davos I was in a, working session with some people from Standard and Poor and the United Nations, a guy named Achim Steiner, who's doing a lot of work on, on natural capital, and how can we put that into bond ratings, right? So we, we look at a country, let's say like Canada, where I'm from, and we would actually look at the supply and demand of water or resources that are, that are critical, and that actually gets factored into the bond rating, if you will. And I'm, I'm, I'm not giving the details enough, and it's not worked out, but there's a sense of pricing that into things, right, in, in, on the natural capital side. And I think, I think we're going to have to go that way. The other one, uh, other piece of work that I'm very excited about is the work done by Ellen MacArthur, you know, the woman who sailed around the world in the Vendee Globe. She's got this foundation, and they're calling it the circular economy, right, which is basically requiring businesses, especially manufacturers, to think more deliberately about what proportion of that material will be recycled. So if, you, if you're making a cell phone, you actually have a standard that says those parts are made such that when you finish using the cell phone, you return it to the people you bought it from, and it's those parts, or 85% of those parts are used again, even if it's in some new technology. And today, I'm, I'm giving you a very gut ball view because it depends by metal and by natural resource. We're, we're, we're recycling about 5% of what we do. So there's huge upside. And I think that's, again, where some regulation may come in. So there's pricing and there's regulation. And I think we'll have to get there, because if we don't, the cons consequences aren't good. My, again, from a very personal point of view, I think a lot of World War II, and you look at what was happening with Japan, and they, they were going through their own version of urbanization and a growth in the middle class uh, that had to be fed. They had resource problems in Asia. And there were tensions around where to find that rubber and oil and so forth. And I'm not saying that's the reason why we had that, that conflict, but it certainly played a part. And I think if, if you are leading a country and you've got 500,000 people coming into Shanghai every year and those people need to be fed 
and you don't have enough food to be able to feed them, you want to find security of supply. And so I think it's a, I don't think we'll get to that outcome, but that if we don't, that's the unintended consequence. I think we'll get a lot of tension because there just won't be enough resources to, to do it. Oh, sorry. I've, oh, why don't we go up there and then to you? Is that, yeah. Name is Colin Supko. Thank you very much uh, for being here. So I wanted to talk to you and ask a question about the personal attribute side of your circle here. Uh, as a world-class consulting company, what are you doing to address the personal attribute situation uh, other than talking to executives about, hey, this is, this is the type of new leaders you need to be bringing up in order to survive in this VUCAT environment? And have you seen any models that have been successful in, uh, in making that happen? It's a great question. I mean, I think um, what we are definitely, we're, and I wouldn't say we're there yet, but we've just done a complete review of our people development side of things. I'll just say one thing is we, in McKinsey, I think McKinsey alum, there are 192 CEOs of billion dollar plus companies that come from McKinsey. And, I, and I'm, that's a very important metric for me that we actually generate CEOs. I'd like people to stay in McKinsey, but the, the big fact of the matter is that 90% of the people leave, probably the good people, actually. They go, I've, I'm not that good, so I step, but that, and they go on and they build, and, and so I'm very keen, what, do, what is it that we're gonna do to ensure we're producing more CEOs than other leaders, if you will, as we go through it? And what we've done is revamped our people process, and we've done a number of, of different things. When I mentioned this tri-sector athlete piece, what we're doing is we've, that's why it's vital for us in having a social sector practice and a public sector practice there, there's important work to be done there, but frankly, the reason, a big reason why we have that is because we want people to have experience in working with those institutions, with leaders in that place. It's part of a, I could think of many other sectors we could focus even more on, but it's very important in my view that those are, each of those sectors is at least 10 to 15%, each of them themselves, of what we do to ensure that everyone has a chance to, to work in it. The second thing we've done is we've opened up our model on secondments. It used to be the case we, ne we weren't allowed to do secondments. When I was in Asia, because I was far away from everyone, I had the view of I asked for forgiveness, not permission. So I did them without permission. I got in trouble a few times. But so having people go and work uh, at an NGO, right, for a year and then come back. Uh, have people go and work in the government uh, at many different levels. Sometimes it's in a delivery unit or working with a prime minister or, or actually even going into a cabinet. So we want to ensure that people have those opportunities for the secondments and we talk about them in terms of, uh, of, of what we're doing and where we are. And the third thing is what we're calling take time, which is more the personal side. And it's something I wished I'd had when I joined, which is that besides your vacation period, we, we let anyone up to a partner level can spend four weeks or eight weeks beyond that and do whatever they want outside of McKinsey, except start a new business. We're not that keen on, I mean, we like people doing, but we're not probably, we're not an incubator. So we, but what we do is, and some people, by the way, just wanna spend time with their family or they wanna do music or they wanna climb Mount Everett. I mean, there's people who've done, but others are actually, I couldn't believe it. We've got a, we've got a group of nine associates that have got together from around the world that are actually helping, they're basically running a telecom company in Afghanistan, and they're doing it on four week and eight week efforts as they go through, it's their own thing, they decided they wanna do it. The only thing I worry about is risk management, that we, you know, they don't, they don't get kidnapped or whatever and how we deal with that, but they've just decided they wanna do that. And so giving people more freedom, if you will, in terms of what they do, because the thing I worry about in, in McKinsey and other places, we work hard, I'm not, I don't wanna, people work very hard, and there's a danger that all you do is work, and then you become a boring idiot. You, if all you do is work, and you don't have hobbies, or you don't have, you're not gonna be a very effective leader. And so that's another, I'm just saying, element that, 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 uh, that we've put in. The, the other thing that we're doing is we have an effort going on with four of our clients where we're exploring what we think new leadership is, and we're taking, we took a combined group of people to Normandy. This may seem like a strange thing to do and say, what, what would you have done if you were uh, going on to Normandy Beach and you don't have it, there isn't actually a battle plan for some, and how do you, how did those guys think about what they're actually uh, gonna do? We took the group to the Fukushima, you know, if you think about the earthquake that's gone on there, or to Acha and said, you guys are now 
leading the response to actually what's happened. What would you actually do? And then we've created scenarios where there's disasters that we, you know, that we, we, we made up. What if someone, what if there was a terrorist attack on the visa um, data center? And if you think about what the credit card information and what that, that actually would be, a, that, that would create a disaster from an economic point of view and growth. So what is it, you guys have two days to be able to figure it out and then we have them uh, actually make a presentation to you know, the head of that organization, to, some, to the National Security Council, just, just some different people. So we're trying, we're learning, if you will, and what are some of the skills that would make you better at that in, in, in how you do it? And so this is, I, I'd say that's the exploration side, and then the, the commitment is we gotta then rewire what it is we do. What are we training people to do? How many different experiences do we give people? I'm in the mo mode now, of, we have to, I'm in the mode of we should be dropping people in more pools even if we, we don't think they can swim, right? So I'll get one, one specific example. I met with the president of Azerbaijan, who's a very interesting guy, wants to turn this country into a whole sort of things. Our normal process about opening up an office here, we'd take a senior person from McKinsey, we'd have them be flying in and talking to people and so forth. What we're gonna do is take a three-year McKinsey person who's there and said, you know what, you're moving to Baku, sorry, that's, you're gonna be your home for the next couple of years. And your job is to build a practice, build a network. You can bring the people in you wanna do. You do it, you're going for two years, go for it, right? And get, we're, we're doing this actually in, in Ghana. I mean, it, there's, and again, I'm not trying to show, well, for the emerging countries, we don't care. So we'll, it's more about, these are the greatest growth opportunities to be able to do it. And so I think we gotta, if you will, if I could call it, fling people into the pool more with, and then discover if they can swim. We'll, we'll try, obviously try and help them if they can't, but I, that's the, yeah. Probably one more question. I, I think it was, yeah, right here. So we talked about China uh, quite a bit and, and you know, also resource conflict. You know, when you look at the current conflict with, with Japan and the East China Sea, you know, maybe not purely rationally explained by resource conflict, how do, like, how do you see that through the lens of all the time that you spent there? Well, I should I look here and I should defer to my colleagues, but I'll t I, I am, that's a conflict that I actually really worry about on the geopolitical side. I mean, there's lots of things, you could worry about Iran, we, can, we could worry about um, you know, um, North Africa and what's going on. I actually do worry about the, that, that conflict. And I think it is, to your point, it's more than just the natural resources that are around those islands. Um, and I, I think what we can't forget is some of the history. And this is probably gonna be very politically correct. And I've got my colleagues here can throw something at me or say it's wrong. And I'll just give you one story. I, I had a, uh, which is I think the emotional side that's there. And I think that the, the need to be able to kind of build more bridges at all sorts of different levels, especially between China and Japan is very important because of the history that's going on. And the story I'll just tell you just quickly, and then it's probably not a very good story. To end up. We had a summer associate conference in Singapore, and we had, there were two uh, Chinese uh, summer st students from there, from Harvard actually. There were two from Taiwan and two from Japan. We were having dinner together. And I looked at the uh, Chinese friends and I said, what would you do if Taiwan seceded, said we're not gonna be part of China. What was probably politically incorrect, but what the hell we'd say. So what, what, if, what would you do if Taiwan seceded? And this one uh, Chinese woman who's working with us said, we'd go to war. I mean, they're part of the motherland. And I said, come on, you, you know, we wouldn't go. She goes, absolutely, that's, they're part of the, they are part of China. And that's, she goes, I like these two guys. They're my friends from Taiwan, I like them. But that's the situation. I went, oh, okay, that, that's interesting. And then I said, what about Japan? And this one particular uh, a woman said, I, I hate the Japanese. And I went, holy God. I said, now, hate is probably too harsh of a, that's an English word. You don't, that's not really a word. She goes, no, I know exactly what that word means. Now, I like those two guys. They're great. But I don't like what's been done before and where it is. And that, that to me, I'm just, it's not a very good example. It's too anecdotal. But I'm just saying, there, I think there's a lot of emotion. And, and I think it's gonna be very important that there be multiple connection points between, you know, it's at high, the high school level, the business level, the social level, so people can really get to know each other and we don't get the nationalism on all sides. And again, maybe you guys could give me a thumbs, I don't know whether you think I'm right, right on how you feel, but I, I think there's, 
I don't think we should underestimate the emotional uh, issues that are there and that they have to be dealt with um, as, we, as we go through it. And I, it's interesting because I lived in Korea for six years. I would say that there's less tension between Korea and Japan. I think there's actually quite a good relationship over time and, and how that's worked. I don't think it's as, as developed between China and Japan. So I think we have to be careful about these conflicts. And the, what I, it, what's interesting, right, and I don't mean to sound, this sounds like, a, I don't mean to end it on a down note, but if you, we're coming up to the anniversary of World War I, and I don't know how many historians are here, but if you think about how that war started, there, there were accidents, a series of accidents in some ways that occurred. And what I worry about in the geopolitical side is a, what if a U.S. naval boat runs over, runs, you know, uh, runs over six North Korean fishing boats somewhere near those islands? When you know what I mean? You just can, and that's why I think communications is going to be key, and that's why I think it's wonderful when we have at the university level and high school level much more interaction so there's a deep social linkage so people can say, I understand, that isn't how those people are. And yeah, that probably, I didn't want to end on an emotional thing like that on the conflict, but I do think we have to realize that with a world that's more volatile and there, there will be scarcities and so forth and also inequality, there'll be, there are very, very rich people and there are very, very poor people. And the very, very poor people with technology now know how the very, very rich people live and some of them aren't exactly happy to see how that, that works. And so I think as business leaders, we need to play a broader role in working with that. That's not up to the government to fix. I think we, sh we should play a role in it. Anyhow, I'll stop at that point. Yeah. <clears throat>